One of the hardest problems with a property manager's job, trust me, I do this. One of the hardest problems is you've got an investor that you work for and have agency with. And in my particular case, he's sitting in California. But I deal with a daily basis with tenants. So it is very difficult to understand and keep in your mind that while you might strike up conversations, and I dare say even a friendship with a tenant, realize your agency is with the client who I see ran deep probably twice a year. Now, we talk on the phone, but I only see him once, twice a year because he lives in California. So I've got agency and my loyalty lies to him, even though I see his tenants way more often than I see him. So it becomes very difficult that you have to tell the tenant something bad from this guy that you don't see a lot. One of the tricks I learned on my own properties was never be the owner of your own rental property, at least to the tenant. Always be the property manager because an owner can make decisions. Property managers can't. I had this one prop rent. I had a four unit in Fountain Square. And one of the guys was always tremendously difficult about collecting rent. Now, if you pushed him, he would always manage to go back in the house, come back out and Ta-da, found a little more cash to cover his rent, all right? But I remember I kept telling him, I'm like, look, dude, if you don't pay the rent, the owner is going to fire me, and tomorrow there'll be a new guy here to collect the rent. You're still going to owe it, and I'm going to get fired. Why don't you help us both out and actually pay what you owe? And invariably, he would go in the house, he'd come back out with the other $20 or, oh, okay, I found this in the cash, in the couch, here you go, you know. It was always that. Well, eventually, it came down to, unfortunately, we evicted him and we're standing in court and the judge asks, are you the owner of the building? And I, yes, yes, your honor, I am. And the guy looked over at me and he's like, son of a because the whole time I kept telling him I'm the property manager. I'm not the owner. Because as the owner, you could say, okay, I'll forgive you for this month, or we'll let it slide, or I know things are tough. Uh, as a manager, I just kept telling him, dude, that's, I got hired to do this. I'll get fired if I don't do my job, come up with the money. And he always would until he didn't. So. <laughs> <clears throat> on page 374 there's a discussion about selecting tenants and this goes back to that fair housing thing as well you should if you're going to get into this game at all come up with criteria on which your tenant must qualify to get put into one of your rental units now the assumption here is the criteria doesn't violate any of those fair housing and that's the whole point. We used to have a scorecard, well, we still do. We have a scorecard that scores a tenant based on four areas of their application. How long have they been employed? What's their gross income? Have they any criminal history? And what is their eviction history? And based on those four numbers, they scored a zero to a five. And then at the bottom, we would add up those numbers and one tenant's application maybe was a 16 and another tenant's application was a 19. Guess who got the property? The 19. Because here's what could happen. Somebody that does not gain the property could potentially come and say, there was a discriminatory thought or process that kept me from getting in the property. I want to sue under the Fair Housing Act. And if you had a defendable methodology of going, look, no, I can't help it. 
you scored a 16, this person scored a 19, that's why they got in, all right? So when you select tenants, you better have some kind of methodology on how you do it and not just randomly go, oh, I like that job or I like the car you're driving, you're the one that's coming in, okay? You can even go so far as date the application or put a time on it. Hey, they were here first, you came in two hours later, all right? There are many different ways. Um, the guy, David, that I was telling you about that owned the property in Nashville, Tennessee, he has got a rule that the tenants have to have renter's insurance as one of the parts of his application. If they don't submit the document saying they have tenants insurance, they get a zero in his category. It's either a zero or a five. His belief is this, if they can't afford the $100 a year for renter's insurance, they probably cannot afford his $1,300 a month rent. So he's using that as one of the basis for selecting tenants, all right? Now, in that collecting rents, there on the page 374, we just did that and talked about it. It's based on the value of the entire property or the entire lease. And when you collect rents, you probably have to discuss how are you collecting rents? For the school that we aren't in right now, that it's an automatic withdrawal from my bank account. Now, it's a commercial property. It's a little different than, say, some tenants. I have one tenant who actually goes to the bank. She has my bank account number and literally deposits the rent check right into my bank account for me because the property is way out in Plainfield. And rather than drive it all the way to Greenwood to give me rent, she actually has been with me now for about five years. So I trust her, I know her, I depend on her. And she's been like clockwork, always just goes to the uh, Chase Bank herself, puts the rent in, gives them the account number and it goes in. There have been people where I've had to go and I show up and I collect rent at the door. I, for residential property, have never been able to use an automatic withdrawal system from their bank account like we do at the school. But once again, that's a commercial property versus residential. Most of the time, mail the rent in, all right? If you have an apartment complex, it could be a drop box at the front door, or they could come into the office and write the check and pay the rent there. So that's something else you have to discuss with your new tenant, or at least in your business model, how are you going to collect rent? Once again, maintaining the relationship with your tenants is key, and it is it, you actually can identify a bad property manager as an owner. One of the ways is to look over the turnover. Look at the turnover. You know, what's the old adage? I told somebody the other day, hey, if somebody says something about you once, they could be lying. If you hear it twice, that could be an anomaly. But if I hear the same thing four different times about you, it's probably the truth, all right? Same concept here. If you've got, as an owner, you're seeing turnover every time, that could be an indication that your property manager is not a good manager. If none of your tenants stay beyond their first lease, one or two, I get 19, there's a problem. Something's going on. They also have to understand how are they requesting maintenance when you have your relationship? Do they stop by the front office, fill out a request, do it online? Our commercial property, once again, slightly different. We have a maintenance request form online. I can go to my uh, dashboard, 
confirm my rent payment that automatically withdraw and also fill out a maintenance request right then. Now, I've been there, <laughs> I've actually been in that building longer than the owner has. Matter of fact, this is the third owner. So I'm pretty good friends with this guy and I've got his personal number. So I will occasionally will call him if there's issues, all right? So when you're dealing with maintenance, there's actually three types of maintenance over on page 376 I wanna talk about. Thumbs up? Are we okay? All right, cool. With maintenance, there are three types. There's this first type called preventative maintenance. Preventative maintenance would be something that you would do to ensure the long-term life of a system in your property. A good example might be the HVAC and changing the air filters. That would be an example that you do it to extend the life of your HVAC system. Seasonal maintenance on your air conditionings and furnace. That would be a preventative maintenance concept. Now, if you fail on your preventative maintenance, you get to do the second one, which is called corrective maintenance or repair. So now you have to repair what's going on. And most property managers, 50, 70% of all maintenance requests are repair because they lack number one. You're too busy putting out fires. Every maintenance request is a repair or corrective. And then the third type of maintenance is called routine maintenance. Landscaping. Maybe vacuuming the entryway on the building. Something that you would do on a regularly short-term basis, once a day, once a week, things of that nature. So you've got preventative maintenance, corrective maintenance, and routine maintenance. And there would be different schedules for all three of those items for your maintenance division to work on. And I'm here to tell you right now, your maintenance program is what will make or break you as a property manager. That is the number one interface between a client, I'm sorry, I misspoke, tenant and the manager. Most tenants don't see the property manager. They walk in, pay the check, or they put it in the mail. But most of the interaction is, hey, I've got a problem. And that will make or break a good property manager. If you ever decide to start a management company, maintenance issues are, should be one of the very first things. How are we going to handle it? In our property management company, I told you we've got a gentleman that lives in one of our units and we swap him out, pay for rent, and we call him our $20 an hour guy because literally he is a very versatile handyman that does nothing but go around and do things that tenants can't or shouldn't do, and we bill him out at 20 bucks an hour to our client. Now, things that require a license, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, we actually subcontract out to two companies that we deal with, but Terry, his name's Terry, Terry's the one that goes around and says, oh, you know, the toilet's plugged up, or the, the gutter has fallen off the side, and he's our maintenance guy that just, every day, that's what he does, all right? 